Good afternoon. Welcome to the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. I'm Tom Carruthers, Vice President for Studies here at the Endowment and your moderator for today's session. It's a huge pleasure for me to serve as moderator at this launch event for Sarah Shea's new book, Thieves of State. It's hard not to feel, looking around the world today, that security challenges are coming at the United States from, it seems like, every different direction. Some people even pine for the, what seemed to be simplicity of the Cold War situation or framework in which one had a clearer sense of the alignment of security challenges to the United States. And it is certainly true that the diffusion of power in the world from the West to the rest has complicated the security landscape considerably. Yet, Sarah has thought carefully about what's happening in many parts of the world and written a book that I think helps change our understanding of it and helps us understand connections between events that we might not normally tie together or connect either analytically or practically. I won't say more because I'm going to leave that to Sarah uh, to tell that story. But I want to introduce not just Sarah, but also Jane Harmon, who's with us. Actually, uh, Congresswoman Harmon is going to go first because she has something else and has to go. So I'm going to introduce both of them now, turn it over to Congresswoman Harmon, and then to Sarah. I think Congresswoman Harmon needs little introduction. She's a prominent and major figure in political and policy life in Washington. She served in the House of Representatives from 1993 till 2011 with only one short break in that time. She served on the committees for Homeland Security, for intelligence <clears throat> and other important uh, areas, armed services. And of course, since 2011, she's the director, the president and the CEO of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. So it's a great pleasure having her here with us at Carnegie. Let me just go ahead and introduce Sarah. Now, Sarah said, Tom, when you introduce me, please make fun of me, <clears throat> um, which if you know Sarah is uh, characteristic, but I'm not going to do that, actually. I'll save that for, for later. Um, uh, because she enjoys a good debate and has an unusual spirit. What I'd like to do is emphasize that Sarah, who's a senior associate in the Democracy and Rule of Law program at Carnegie and has been for several years, is not a conventional think tank researcher, if there is such a thing. There are several attributes that make Sarah distinctive. First, she didn't grow up wanting to be a think tank researcher or a policy analyst. She didn't dream when she was 22 of getting some good internship in Washington and then never leaving. I think she dreamed of never living in Washington. Um, instead, she came to the policy, the world of policy action and policy analysis through life experience through observation and engagement in difficult places, not just Afghanistan, as is well known, but the Balkans and elsewhere. So that's the first thing that's distinctive. Second, in this city in which the past is yesterday and the distant past is last week, Sarah is interested in history. She has an abiding interest in trying to understand the relationship between what we're living today and what has happened before. In a deeper sense, she's a synthetic thinker in a city where most of us learn to parse, to categorize, to dissect, and to analyze. She puts things together in her mind, which is unusual and, and I think powerful. And third, Sarah cares. This is a city where a lot of us come to Washington caring about injustices in the world and wrongs. And it's hard sometimes in this professionalized world in which we live here in Washington not to put one's passions and ideas in a box and in a sense let the, the emotions atrophy and treat them in a kind of clinical way. Sarah doesn't do that. They're not in a box in Sarah. They're up front. And I think that's something that's a, a refreshing change in Washington. And she puts it to good use not just in this book and that all the work she does. So not a conventional researcher but I can tell you an invaluable part of the team at Carnegie. We're glad to have her. Now let me turn first to Congresswoman Harmon, eager to hear your remarks, then we'll turn it over to Sarah. Thank you. Tom, that was beautiful and very appropriate. 
And first, let me offer apologies for speaking and running, uh, kind of literally. Uh, it's the middle of the Wilson Center board meeting, and I also have food poisoning, so <laughs> please forgive me. Um, I was Sarah's father's research assistant at Harvard Law School a thousand years ago. So I don't think Sarah was that interesting way back then, but maybe she was. Uh, quite, sm quite small at the time. But I have been thrilled to see Thieves of State get the attention and praise it deserves. And not just because Sarah is my additional daughter, which she is, uh, but, and not just because I make a cameo as the tenacious woman leading a codel to Afghanistan in 2009 in the book, but because uh, there is nobody else like Sarah. Tom had that nailed. Um, there's no one who cares this much and who is so brave. Uh, during my trip to Afghanistan in 2009, one of many I made at, while a member of Congress, and one of many on which I saw Sarah, she took me to a local Shura Council meeting where she had a frank talk with community elders about corruption. If you don't get rid of Karzai's brother, they told us, we're going to join the Taliban. That's how bad the frustration was. Sarah was an old friend of theirs by that point, and I asked them whether they were doing enough to keep her safe. At first, Sarah refused to translate my question, and then she didn't want to translate their, an their answer either uh, in her flawless Pashtu, but I insisted, and she gave in, and their answer was, of course we'll keep her safe. She's our sister. So I'm encouraged by the reaction to this book because the message is urgent, because corruption has sparked crises of legitimacy worldwide and has led to instability and increased terrorism. And you couldn't come up with a better messenger than Sarah, who has the insight that only comes from trusting some of the leaders, then witnessing with disappointment their actions, then confronting the challenges head on, on the ground, where people live them, and then writing this brave book. One moral I took away from, from that Shura Council meeting, uh, there's no substitute for communication with ordinary citizens. I learned more in those two hours than in any of my other CODEL briefings over many trips. And I think that is a point Sarah makes in the book, and she makes it well, and I uh, enthusiastically support it. As Sarah points out, too often we take for granted that governments speak for their people. That leaves us flying blind in regions where we lack the cultural understanding to make firsthand judgments ourselves. And if we pay more attention to what locals have to say rather than the people we always talk to, we might get better information faster about big events. That goes for social media, too. Think the Arab Spring. I hope more members of Congress will do what I did and insist on meetings outside the box. The other thing Congress can do, require that a clear set of policy objectives be part of any military or economic assistance package to any country before voting on it. Finally, corruption <coughs> isn't, a pretty, isn't a priority for regular intelligence collection. So we aren't checking whether key sources are corrupt which means our information can often be skewed. A powerful review in The New Yorker last week, which I hope you all read, was the start of a serious reckoning with Sarah's subject. Of course, she's mentioned uh, multiple times in the review. Corruption undermines every urgent challenge we face. It cripples our narrative. When instead we help allies establish transparent institutions, when we put our aid and expertise behind fair and inclusive government, that's a win for America's interests and our values. That's what makes corruption, as Sarah rightly says, quote, a matter of national security. It cuts to the core of our strategic goals. And at a time when we are seriously tested in Ukraine, uh, in Central Europe, in Africa, and elsewhere, this is when Sarah's book should have been published, and what do you know, it is. Uh, so please welcome my daughter, Tom's colleague, uh, your friend, uh, and someone everyone must admire. 
the indomitable Sarah Chase. That's uh, tough. <laughs> I can't uh, thank both of you enough. Uh, I think it's going to be pretty difficult to actually live up to, um, to these descriptions. Um, but let's launch into, and also Jane has now kind of stolen some of my thunder here uh, uh, with some of the implications of what I want to say. So, so I'd love to roll this back a little bit and let's walk through the logic. And it may sometimes seem obvious, but it hasn't seemed obvious in this town. So I'd just like to, to take it on. So uh, as Jane mentioned, um, I come at this issue not uh, theoretically, and not from a Western perspective. I come at it from about a decade on the ground in Afghanistan. Um, and I didn't go there intending to talk about corruption or to get involved in corruption. I was trying to reconstruct a country, and in particular, starting with a village that um, had been destroyed in, in the anti-Taliban bombing campaign. Uh, we needed stone to build the foundations of the villagers' homes that we were rebuilding. We couldn't get any stone. Stone, right? What does Afghanistan have? It's got sun and it's got stone. We couldn't get any stone because the governor had declared a monopoly on stone. It all belonged to him. So he could crush it into gravel and sell it at inflated prices to the military that was establishing its base in the region. Um, and um, what I quickly came to understand was that this corruption that we discovered trying to build villages was making people so angry that it was in fact driving them into the arms of the Taliban. And that's a connection that I want to try to develop a little bit more explicitly here. And the first thing I want to say is this isn't just Afghanistan, right? As Tom sort of ran through for us at the beginning, let's, what's in the news, right? Yemen, Ukraine, I, ISIS in Iraq and Syria, uh, much of North Africa, Nigeria, really different places, really disparate crises. And yet, I would submit that there is a thread linking them together. And what it is, is that every one of those has been an extremely corrupt environment as the crisis erupted. OK, corruption, right? The C word. What, what are we talking about? What does corruption mean? It's a really interesting and somewhat vague word that has a kind of dual meaning, right? I mean, it's got this very clear material quid pro quo bribery uh, technical uh, um, dictionary definition. But it also has this implication of a moral depravity to it. But I'd like to point to three different aspects of corruption in the environments I'm talking about. And the first one is, it's not chump change, right? That's a picture of the disparity between the amount of oil that Nigeria was sending between uh, the beginning of 2000, sorry, the, uh, it's 18 months, the beginning of 2012 until July of 2013. The shortfall was $20 billion over an 18-month period, a $1 trillion a year in illicit financial flows, according to global financial integrity. And that's very conservative, because it doesn't include cash. Um, in Afghanistan, outflows of illicit money, a $1 billion in reported cash, in the cash that people actually admit that they're taking out of the airport in a year in 2010. Bribery, Afghanistan, poor country, the petty bribes that you keep hearing about, two to five billion dollars a year in petty bribery in Afghanistan. So this has real economic significance, right? This is not odorless. It's actually something that makes an impact on, in opportunity cost in these countries. But it's not just these big numbers and the sort of invisible siphoning off, invisible except in opportunity cost. It's also in your face. It's a daily attack on people's, oops, sorry, that's a microphone there. On people's integrity, I mean, on people's dignity, their sense of dignity. In Uzbekistan, I'm, rep I'm reporting this book. I'm doing research on this book. I'm sitting for this book. I'm sitting in a very nondescript restaurant with an Uzbek 
a journalist because he doesn't want to be seen by anyone. And the guy is wringing his hands because he feels that he's probably going to have to sell his car so that his son can get into university, although his son passed the entrance exams. But you can't get in without paying this kind of bribe. Nurullah, this is the story I start Thieves of State out with. He is a young, proud, former police officer who came to work for me after his boss, the police chief, was blown up in an IED. So he comes to work for me. His brother is also a young, proud Afghan man, runs an auto parts store. He's buying auto parts in Pakistan. He's coming up the hour and a half ride to Kandahar, and he's shaken down every couple miles, right? A dollar here, a couple dollars there, but it's some 16-year-old police kid with a Kalashnikov over his shoulder who gets in his face and demands the money, right? Fifth or sixth time, he gets to the gates of Kandahar. The cop is saying, give me some money. And he says, forget it. I, I, I paid you people already. I, you know, five or six times up in the road, I even paid my customs, which is pretty rare. So he says, no. The guy reaches into the car and smacks him. Afghanistan, a young, proud man. Nurullah, telling us this story, says, next time I see somebody planting an IED and I see a police car driving down that road, I'm not saying a word. Now, is that factually true? I don't know. But if he was saying that, plenty of people were doing it. They weren't informing on the Taliban. They might have been joining the Taliban. And you know, it, it's in your face in other ways, too. It's in your face in how people flaunt it, right? I mean, the, you should sit, right? I mean, that's Yanukovych. You, Kabul, there's a whole neighborhood in Kabul that's the drug, I mean, it's the, you know, it's the corrupt officials in the drug lords neighborhood. They're driving around in cars that people know how much those cars cost. The average, I think the salary of Nigerian public official, officials, the official salary is a million dollars a year, right? Meanwhile, the populations of these countries are walking around barefoot. Um, this leads to rage. And I think we in America, you know, here we are in the district. We know something about corruption in the district. We live right next door to the state of Virginia. But I don't think we experience this personally in quite the same way. And I think that's why we tend to underestimate the amount of rage that this can generate. Um, and then finally, I want to say that we also have a tendency to think of it as, you know, kind of a corrosion eating at a government system or a government that has some corrupt people in it or a government that is plagued by corruption. We tend to see it as sort of marginal to the, to the institutions that we're talking about. And this is the other really big kind of mind bend that I want to try out on you guys. I think this is a system a very successful system at doing what it's setting out to do. This is, and again, provocative language, these are vertically integrated criminal organizations that are effectively doing what they aim to do, which is steal the money. And then when, and if you think about it that way, you know, it really explains a lot of how they're functioning. Um, the levers of power, the levers of state power, are in fact captured and put to the service of this objective. So one of the most ex interesting examples I encountered, again, researching this, was Tunisia, which in some ways was the opposite of Afghanistan in that it's a really bureaucratic country, Tunisia, under Ben Ali. The IRS, the Tunisian IRS, I sat down with the tax collector, and he explained how it worked. And the way it worked was um, Jane didn't have to pay her taxes. But he never threw her file away. He put it at the bottom of the stack. When sh her business, when the Woodrow Wilson Center started doing really well, Sakhar Matri or his minions would show up and say, cut us in. If she said no, suddenly she was audited. Millions, and she was out of business. I mean, one of the most diabolical versions of this was dates. I went down to date oases, which are among the most beautiful environments I've ever seen. And what you quickly learn is what matters is the water. 
And the water now is, there are these big pipes, right? And who has control over the pipes? The agriculture department. So Sakhar al-Matri goes down and he wants Deglat Nur, the most beautiful Tunisian dates, which are sold in the Gulf for very high prices. They want it at below market price. And if you don't fork them over, suddenly you don't have enough water anymore. So the government bureaucracies are actually instrumentalized. They are used either as enforcement arms or ways of extracting money. And those that aren't are often hollowed out. So I've frequently heard that corruption arises where there are state weaknesses, that state weaknesses somehow give space for corruption to um, seep in, if you will. And I'm arguing the opposite, that in many cases, the corrupt kleptocratic networks, if you will, deliberately weaken some state functions. For example, the judiciary. If they can't capture the judici judiciary, they'll weaken it so that they can ensure impunity for their people. What about the militaries in Iraq, in Ukraine, in, in uh, Nigeria? They have both been serving as revenue streams for the kleptocratic networks in those countries, but also they've been hollowed out to prevent any kind of a potential coup, right? Um, so that's what I'm arguing a lot of these environments look like. What are the consequences? My thunder got stolen just a little bit, but let's start with religious extremism, right? First of all, Nur Allah is pissed off uh, he said, I wouldn't warn the police. Maybe if you were even a little bit more pissed off, uh, he'd say, Who, who's got a gun? And you've got the Taliban sitting in his town saying, here's a gun. Take it and use it and use it against the police. That's what you ought to be doing. So, so there are people standing at the ready to exploit these grievances. Um, and secondly, these extremist groups give people an explanation. Why is it that our government is preying upon us in these ways? Because it's not following the strictures of religion. Your government is abusive because it's irreligious. And you're starting to get that, for example, in Central Asia, where that was never an argument you know, 20, 30 years ago. Um, the Islamists are starting to make this connection. The government's corrupt because it's secular. And that's been the really interesting discovery for me in doing this research, is that this linkage between public integrity and personal morality, it's a reflex that actually does um, permeate or, or, or weave through uh, relatively recent, at least, human history. And where I was really struck by this um, was noticing that Again, it's not just now, and it's not just an Islam thing. And where I really noticed that was in going back to read the 95 Theses, Martin Luther, right? So Martin Luther, you, I mean, indulgences, anyone? Simony? You read the 95 Theses, and much of it is about corruption. And there was a bunch of other um, literature during that period, there were grievances, petitions that were sent to Rome. Do you remember the system diagram that was up there on Afghanistan? There was enough material in the grievances of the German people against Rome for me to draw the same diagram for the Catholic Church in 1500. Um, money was being extracted and going up the line and going down the line were benefices and, um, and protection, impunity, salvation to the people, right? That was, the, that was the toll booth. So if you look at, I'm not saying the Protestant Reformation wasn't a spiritual event, right? But if you look at the doctrinal changes, you'll see that most of them occur where the Catholic Church had a toll booth. Kajing. Um, and the Protestant Reformation was not a very um, calm and peaceful affair. It was violent. It was extreme. Uh, people went on a tear through buildings, and they weren't just delicately knocking the features off statues because icons were blasphemous. 
They were pulling open the trunks. They were, they were melting down the plate. They were breaking the marble altars. They were going after every manifestation of this incredible wealth that the church had amassed and that the church was parading around in front of their faces, just like those SUVs driving around Kabul. The church was parading statues around with velvet and jewels bedecking the marble statues. Um, it was violent. And a little bit later, John Locke, we Americans ought to know about John Locke. A lot of his thinking is incorporated into our constitutional um, dispensation. He was a Puritan too. And he actually predicted this type of reaction and this um, confluence between or, or, or reflex to go for moral purity as a way of getting at public integrity. He said, and I'm paraphrasing just a little bit because the guy's prolix, I mean, right? <laughs> when there's a barefaced resting of the law to serve the purposes of a man or a party of men, and I'm going to interrupt right in the middle of that quote right now to say, that sounds exactly what a Tunisian was telling me was happening under Bin Ali. He said, they make villainous laws to circumvent law by law. I found that such a powerful statement. So Locke says, when people do that, when they rest the law to serve the purposes of a man or a party of men, war is made on the sufferers. Pretty powerful. Having no appeal on earth to write them, having no appeal on earth to write them, they, will, they are left to the only remedy in such cases, an appeal to heaven. Now, at the risk of shocking you by putting, juxtaposing these two, let me put that quote in the words of Osama bin Laden in one of his videos. He said, some people in this case will appeal for an alternative upright methodology in which it's not the business of any class of humanity to lay down its own laws to its own advantage. And that methodology, he says, is the methodology of God most high. Of course, this is cynical exploitation of grievances. I'm not trying to say these are identical. It's cynical exploitation of grievances. But if we don't understand why it works and try to reduce the grounds for that argument, we're just going to keep on minting terrorists faster than our drones can take them out of circulation. That's the argument that I'm trying to make. Um, obviously, and this is a lot of the work of the initiative here at Carnegie, we're not just talking about religious extremism. There are a variety of other security challenges that are also um, fueled by acute corruption, such as you know, uh, uh, symbiotic alliances between governments and transnational criminal superpowers, revolutions, we've been seeing that. So this map you know, uh, sort of shows you all of the different and very clear security crises that have been fueled by corruption in different categories. Um, and then finally, let's make clear, obviously, corruption isn't the only factor driving these security crises. Um, it's intersecting with other risk factors. And you can pull those out. Uh, one of them we've all heard about is high unemployment, right? You know, that's what caused the Arab Spring, high unemployment, except the people suffering that high unemployment said the reason we're unemployed is because Gamal Mubarak privatized the state-owned enterprises into his own hands, into the hands of his cronies who just flipped them and didn't do any um, investment in them or modernize them in any way. So half a million Egyptians were thrown out of work during the uh, privatization process there. Um, identity rifts, right? Obviously, Ukraine, Syria, Iraq, uh, Nigeria to some extent. Um, but why I've really picked out corruption is because, number one, it's overlooked, right? I mean, you hear about those other ones. You do not hear about corruption. It's not entertained as a security issue in deputies committee or principals committee meetings in this town. Um, but worse, this is the one factor that we're actually exacerbating by how we're interacting in these countries, right? We in the United States and in other Western, other Western governments, businesses, philanthropies even are exacerbating this problem. Um, 
we're not exacerbating identity rifts, right? We kind of can't have an impact on how much, I mean, maybe to some extent with, um, uh, I don't know, public expression. But fundamentally, this is the one that we're actually making worse. And so the point that I'm making today is when I hear that security is key, right? We have to deal with the security crises first. Then, Sarah, then we'll get to governance and corruption later when we've got time. The causal logic there is wrong. It's not a trade-off, corruption or security. By ignoring or even enabling corruption, the US government and other interveners is making the security problem worse. That's the argument. Let's turn this into a conversation. I think that um, we can get into what the implications of this theory are or thesis are for a lot of the domains um, in which we're all operating in this town. Thank you very much indeed. Sarah, let me start by, if you don't mind just asking one or two questions to get the discussion going, and then I'll, I'll turn to the audience. And I know that you kind of like to lead your own discussion, so if you want to leap up and start calling on people, <laughs> you can do that too. Um, the first is, I think maybe some people are wondering, I've as I've thought about the book and talked about it with others, I've, I've heard this question, and so I thought I'd give you a chance to address it directly, which is one reaction is to say, well, gee, most countries in the world have some degree of corruption. You know, corruption isn't black or white, it's gray, and some are light gray, and some medium, some dark, et cetera. And are you talking about a difference in amount or a difference in kind? This is a qualitative or a quantitative difference. Obviously, there isn't like just an extremely sharp line if somebody said, well, gee, you know, industries in South Korea have traditionally benefited from certain inbreeding of political and business sectors, and look at South Korea, they're doing pretty well, yet there is an institutionalized form of corruption. How do you determine or how do you distinguish what you mean by systematic corruption? And is it, is it how recognizable is it sort of analytically or through observational terms? I think it's a great question, of course, and it's one that we've been working on here, um, trying to get at um, you know, indicators and degree and kind. Um, it's very difficult because most of, you know, we've all heard of the Transparency International per Corruption Perceptions Index, which is a vertically ranked thing, which is a very helpful instrument, but it doesn't really get at these questions. And for example, Tunisia in 2009 was looking great on the transparency rankings. So it is a qualitative issue, and I think it has to do with this structuring of the system. So the degree to which um, the whole apparatus of the state is being put to the service of the personal enrichment of uh, the ruling clique. Um, I also think it's important the degree to which it is affecting people in their daily lives. Uh, but we have tended to find that the, as we've looked at different countries, that this distinction that people make between petty corruption and grand corruption, you can't really make that distinction. Where there is significant grand corruption, there's usually uh, significant petty corruption, and in fact, they're linked by this vertically integrated system where the cop on the street who's shaking down Nurala <coughs> He's not just putting that money in his pocket. His, uh, you know, uh, precinct commander or whatever it might be is taking a cut. Um, often, a person will actually buy their position in the police. They may have to go into debt to buy their position in the police. Then they get, they shake people down, they pay back their debt, they pay off their superiors. It's a system. So I think the systematized nature of it, but the degree to which, in terms of security risk, um, the degree to which it impacts people on a daily level is also important, I think. And then it's the other risk factors. But even with those risk factors, um, if you say, for example, Tom Friedman has been working on the impact of global warming on the Arab Spring because there, were, there was a, a drought that was affecting part of Syria, for example. So, so we um, um, started looking at, okay, what countries in our bucket of in our basket of countries are suffering significant environmental pressures? Wow, every place is, right? Every, every country in the world has some kind of environmental pressure. So we're still in the process of getting more rigorous about precisely the mm -hmm. types of measures that you're talking about. I think by highlighting the vertical integration, you partly answered a puzzle to me, which is when you talk about the 
the experience of the citizen encountering the policeman again and again and the anger. I was at the same time you were saying that, I was also thinking about the fact that at least in places like Tunisia, and Philippines under Marcos and a number of other places, there's also been a citizen attention to just the president's family. Yes. It's often the, the, the spouse, the kids, the cousins, et cetera, in an intense focus of just anger on the news about the shopping trip to Paris where they come back with $34,000 worth of shoes or, you know, whatever. Um, and so I was puzzling to myself, as you said, it, is, it, is it the experience day to day or is it the, the intense focus or on Gabal Mubarak and his circle? It was really just a small circle of people. And so you're saying that there's an organic they're connection. They're linked. That, yeah. And people usually know that they're linked, although I do think your, the, your, your suggestion is right that sometimes people will cut the cop some slack because they know, they know cops, right? And they know what salaries they're getting and they're getting crappy salaries. Now, that doesn't quite explain why they would buy their position, right? There's something going on. But sometimes there's a degree of tolerance or sympathy for the guys at the bottom because their salaries are bad and often in these places, particularly a place like Afghanistan, the police are also the front lines against the Taliban and they're getting slaughtered. They're getting absolutely slaughtered. So, but, but then the $36,000 worth of shoes, that goes back to this relative thing that I'm barefoot. I mean, you saw the picture of the kids there. They're barefoot. And when the wife of the president you know, is walking around in more shoes than she knows how to do, what to do with, it's really insulting. It's insulting, and so that's another thing we've been working on with a neuroscientist here is not so much corruption specifically, but how does when does inequality push people over the brink? And part of it is, is this relative issue. Yeah, different question. I'm sure a lot of the people in this room, and of course a lot of people in the broader policy community have been interested in, focused on, trying to address corruption for, for decades, really. It was back in the 90s. There was an article, The Corruption Eruption, by a colleague here at Carnegie, Moises Naim. And I'm sure some people have said to you, hey, we're on to this. Mm -hmm. You know, we've been, we've been at this. The World Bank has been making anti-corruption a major priority since the mid-1990s. USAID has anti-corruption programs. Every major donor, in some ways, pays deference to the importance of corruption. And so, what is it that you say to them when they say, no, no, we're, we've got it, thanks. A little bit of push from you is good, but we're, we're sort of working on it. Fundamentally, what I see in those organizations is um, the whole issue gets offloaded onto them. Mm -hmm. um, from by whom? By mainstream policymakers, okay. by, let's say, you know, the Secretary of State, mm -hmm. the President. Mm -hmm. Oh, corruption, that's something USAID ought to work on. So it's seen as, a humanitarian. We can get on with our business with this government. Well, you, you sort, you smooth out the edges. Well, right, and we'll spend money on it. In other words, how do you address corruption? You spend money to do anti-corruption programming. Mm -hmm. um, and I would submit that um, first of all, again, what message is the country receiving? Let's take again a country like Afghanistan, where. The US government was spending money on anti-corruption programming, and then the US government was spending several million dollars a month to corrupt the president, right? I mean, what is the president of the country, which message is he going to listen to more loudly? Who does he think matters? When you are good luck, Jonathan, or you are Hamid Karzai, does the CIA matter? You know, does USAID programmers matter, or somebody like me? Mr. President, you should really be a little bit less corrupt, you know? Or does the CIA count as the US government? So what <coughs> message are we sending? And that's really what I'm trying to get at here is this is not, certainly anti-corruption programming could potentially, um, ideally aimed at civil society, could help build the expertise, the sophistication, and the courage of local reformers who are up against the government, but if the bulk of US government interaction with that government in fact reinforces it, then this type of programming doesn't really stand much of a chance. So what I'm really trying to do is say, hey, this has got to be central to every way the US government interacts with this country. It means that our, our um, development assistance, first of all, uh, back to what Jane said, intelligence. It's not just that, in, that we're getting poor intelligence because we're getting our intelligence from corrupt actors. It's that we have not even, we, 
US intelligence agencies have not made this a target of collection or analysis. So I think out on the table out there, another sort of Carnegie wonky version of this thesis is a set of questions. Priority intelligence requirements. These are the types of questions that ought to be asked in environments like this before we invest uh, development assistance before we invest military assistance, and even in how we interact with their leaders. So back to good luck, Jonathan and Boko Haram, you saw the graph with the ridiculous amounts of theft going on in the oil revenues. The guy who found the figures that uh, we, Cheyenne, here converted into a graph um, was the governor of the central bank. Uh, he submitted a detailed memorandum suggesting the various scams by which the $20 billion had been stolen. And he was a, had called in the bankers over whom he had regulatory authority and said, guess what, I'm sending my examiners to see you guys next week. At which point they went to good luck Jonathan, fired the guy. Fired the guy. Three or four months later, Boko Haram kidnaps 250 school children. And we all heard about that, right? We all Americans heard about that. And President Obama and Secretary Kerry got very excited about how we need to help Good Luck Jonathan find the girls. They didn't say anything about $20 billion. And I guess that's what I'm trying to say. It needs to be mainstreamed. Well, let's put, a, in a sense, a harder edge on it by going to your experience in Afghanistan. Is, uh, I know that when you were there, you arrived at these ideas bit by bit, but then they, they crystallized in a way. And you began as an advisor to the US military and the, the coalition security forces. You began to uh, push this message to people. Um, I suspect some people who heard the message thought, you know, in a sense, it's sort of like we're standing on uh, a, a sort of plate of ice here in this country. And you're talking about sort of turning over the plate of ice and a whole different relationship to a government which we're so deeply invested in. So were they, what was the reaction? Was it that's, that's sort of in a sense we can't even go through that door? And then how did you respond to that? And sort of how did you help them find a useful approach based on your, your thing? That was exactly, that was exactly the reaction. It was in comprehension. I would train incoming headquarters elements. Um, and many of them came from non-US countries whose own governments had sold this mission as we're here to support the democratically elected government of Afghanistan. Trying to get them to understand that no, that government is part of the problem. It was almost more than they could metabolize and we would get into fights at these trainings actually. And eventually I decided I can't do this anymore because it's counterproductive. Um, and then you would have, and this is really easy to understand, you've got a battalion commander, right? This is a 40-year-old who's got 1,700 to 1,000 men and women under his command, and he is out there on the pointy edge of the spear fighting the enemy. And I'm saying, guess what? You need to start fighting another enemy. And he's like, are you kidding me? That, you know, they're going to then start shooting at my guys too. So I'm going to, I'm going to be, my guys are going to be caught in the crossfire. It was a pretty difficult argument to make, um, both to, you know, but a number of military commanders did start to get it and they did understand the cause and effect. But I would say in answer to the second part of your question, I never did. I mean, I, I developed so many plans for how to do this and with obviously other people. Um, and we talked about how you mitigate the risks. What are the likely, um, what are the likely counter moves? These are sophisticated, self-interested networks. If you push on them, they are going to counter move. So on some of these, one at a very high level that I did for Admiral Mullen as when he was chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, you know, went through a couple of scenarios for how you could really address this. And then there would be a list of likely Karzai counter moves. How do you mitigate the risk of the counter moves? And what is the likely outcome? And then what's my recommendation, pro or con, this particular approach? And I think we had five different options in that paper. Um, we just never went there. We just yes. never went there. Let's turn to the audience. Um, I'll Why don't you do it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thanks, Tom. Uh, I'll, I'll call on some people. I'd like you, we are filming, I would like you to identify yourself. Please speak clearly Inch and please keep your questions to a manageable size. Um, that would be great. I'll start right here with this gentleman. Yeah. 
Uh, yes, sir. Uh, my name is Kami, but I'm with the Pakistani Spectator. Please and my start with the... Uh, the Pakistani Spectator. Good, and my question is, let's say there are two groups, Saudi group that have Taliban and Mujahideen, and then you have secular Muslim, uh, Muslim who are supported by American from, uh, you know more about Afghanistan than anybody else here, but in Pakistani uh, military, Ayub, General Ayub was here, he was on CIA payroll. General Zia, his daughter lives in uh, New York. General Musharraf, his son in Boston. The current general, Pakistani Sharif, his whole, I think part of his family live in California. So these people have more loyalty with America, actually, than they have faith in their own country or in their own religion. And when you bring American, especially religious fundamentalists who think something wrong with Islam, Islam is somehow genetically pro-violent and corrupt. I mean, they don't have the kind of insight experience you have in Afghanistan. You can see these things are, Corruption is part of the system there. It's, it has nothing to do with Islam or any religion. So how Thank would you, you choose Saudi Arabian, uh, the guy who are very small and they do very small corruption, and then they have very plain straight forward, just to cut your hand, cut your, you know, or you do support American who are very secular Muslim, but their whole clan lives in America and they are supported by the American system or American taxpayers, and you really don't have any better option than these two groups. Thanks. Uh, I think um, the, the point is a really good one that these, po it, 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 I mean, there are a lot of points there, so it's, it, uh, let me try to field a couple. One is these populations are confronted often with two unacceptable alternatives. One is a corrupt, uh, kleptocratic ruling elite, and the other is a um, kind of sadistic terrorist network. Neither of those is really acceptable to the bulk of the population. So I would have Afghan villagers telling literally elders striking themselves in the face saying, you know what, the Taliban hit me on this cheek and the government hits me on this cheek. I mean, they were just beside themselves. So I, I think that's a really important issue and, and why, again, I think governance is so important to focus on because the point is to provide people with a more palatable alternative. The other point you make is that a number of these corrupt officials are stashing their money and their kids and their assets in the West. And that's one of the ways that the West enables this because we're not looking at the dirty money and we're making it easy for people to enjoy their ill-gotten gains. So one of the most important ways that we in the West can't transform these countries from the outside. That's the work of their own populations. But we can help their populations by altering the incentive structure a little bit, by making it just a little bit less easy to enjoy some of these uh, riches. And I find it really interesting that, for example, a lot of asset seizure work was done on Mubarak assets after the revolution. My point is, if those assets were criminal, they were criminal before the revolution, why weren't we seizing them then? Similarly, on Nigeria, there's been a pretty good asset recovery case, um, 480 some million dollars of Abacha assets. Abacha is four rulers back in Nigeria. He's dead. That's no deterrent. In fact, the message that that sends might be the reverse. That may be sending a message that says, don't worry, good luck, Jonathan. We'll get busy with these other assets, and we're not going to disturb you. So um, how th that's among the levers. You'll see at the end of Thieves of State, and at the end of the paper that's, um, that should be out on the table, a list of tools that are available to different actors in addressing this problem. I don't show how you would put them together in a particular case. I'm just saying, hey, there's plenty of things we can do. And one of them is deny some visas. Uh, I'll go here to this one and then over here, please. Hi, my name's Kristen. I'm an advisor to Syria Deeply. Thank you so much for your talk. It's Excuse been... me, just... Oh, sorry, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, great. Advisor to... Syria Deeply. Um, so, corruption is one of my personal fascinations, and thank you very much for your comments. Um, I'm sort of curious, you, you talk about the government being a really good mechanism to influence, you know, corruption, I mean, from a U.S. aid standpoint, 
but a lot of corruption has also infiltrated the population, you know, of all of these countries. So what do you think is the best mechanism for adjusting that? Is it societal change? Is it civil society organizations? Is it the government of the nation? What do you think is the best way for change there? I think that's a really important question because it gets at this um, comment that one often hears, oh, culture, sorry, corruption is part of the culture in X country or Y country. And you know, on the face of it, that would bother me because I would be hearing that comment from Americans, right? And I never had an Afghan come up to me and say, Sarah, would you get off your corruption jag? We don't really mind it, you know? Like, would you just stop talking about it because it's part of our culture? I don't hear that, but. <laughs> But what I do see is that Afghans fork it over. And I see it, I mean, I would say Nigeria is a place um, where it's really almost heartbreaking to watch it because as one person who, was an, uh, who is an IT specialist in the Department of Defense, and those people know a lot, um, so that was why she was a really interesting person to, uh, to interview. But at some point she said, you know, we the poor are preying upon the poor because we can't prey upon the rich because, because they own the laws and they own the instruments of force. So we prey on each other. And her sister, who cleans houses for a living, would tell me how if you had gotten someone a job as a house cleaner, for example, in an embassy or something like that, you would often take a percentage, a cut of that person's salary. So you're right that in places where this has gone really too far, it does start to permeate the population. And there, the reform effort is a much more problematic one. I spent the last trip to Nigeria actually asking some kind of philosophical questions that touched on what you were saying. I mean, seriously, I asked people quite simply, has the meaning of money changed in your lifetime? And the answers I got were just incredibly eloquent, pained, articulate, but they were talking about precisely the transformation that you're describing. 20, 30, 40 years ago, people were not demanding a cut of their friends' salaries when they helped them get a job. Today, they are. And I talked to people who were just at their wits' ends about how to, um, how to grapple with that and, and you know, who would say, this is corrupt, it's corrupt and corrupting. And so I do think it, you need a social movement and you need people to basically have the courage to refuse to pay the bribe. Have the courage collectively, and that might have to be a movement that says, you know, if I myself don't pay the bribe, I just won't get my, my stuff done. But if a large proportion of the population says, we're all boycotting bribes, I mean, we have African women who boycotted sex with their husbands over certain issues. You know, that's pretty intense. So you could start a movement like that. We're going to boycott paying bribes. But I also do think that a change in the absolute impunity that you see at the top of the system will also have a trickle-down effect on people's, on kind of public morality of ordinary people. I mean, just at the end there, you, there was an issue lurking in my mind, and it came to the fore when you said what you just said. I was comparing in my mind China and India and thinking, as you mentioned, you know, <clears throat> social movements. And of course, India has had the I paid a bribe uh, movement, or, uh, and a lot of bottom-up activity on corruption. China, on the other hand, has had a leader, now a new leader, who is, yeah, has made clearly a decision that this is, in a sense, a serious long-term threat to the stability or the longevity of Communist Party rule in the country and has taken a different approach. They're very different societies. Is it one or the other? Is it ideally both together? How, how do I we think it's decisions? ideally both together. I really do. I think that as wonderful as social movements are, um, short of revolution, mm -hmm. I think it's really difficult for them to force reform mm -hmm. on a system this entrenched. Um, but I'm really suspicious of the top-down only mm -hmm. movement. I, I really believe in the people. I mean, I work with yeah, you, right? right? I well, believe in the people well, as... But, but isn't there almost a contradiction in the sense that if they if you have the strong enough hand to do it from the top, that hand is likely not to be very tolerant of a loose, potentially threatening social movement. And the countries that have the loose social movements are not likely to have the strong hand necessary to. Work. I think that's probably an accurate description of reality. You asked me what would be ideal. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's take another question. We have a gentleman right here, then I'll come up to the front. Yes, right there. 
Hi, thank you. Uh, Monas Khan from Al Jazeera. Um, in South Asia, corruption, I think, is rampant, you know, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Afghanistan. But one thing I think is very interesting, in Bangladesh, 1.5 million people out of 150 million people are paying their taxes, which is an unofficial number because so many people are paying the petty bribes that you're already referring to. But in India and Bangladesh, India following partition and Bangladesh following their war with Pakistan, they instituted wealth redistribution through land reform. Afghanistan and Pakistan are still very much... Um, you know, in, indebted within a feudal structure, a feudal power structure. I'm just wondering, um, your, you know, scholarship in Afghanistan and whatever you may know about Pakistan, is feudalism tied to terrorism at all? Is it a reaction to feudalism? Or are these feudal lords also warlords that are motivating violence themselves? I'm just wondering if there's a connection between the feudal kind of structures of Afghanistan and Pakistan, and why you see so much more terrorism in those countries than you do in India and Bangladesh? Um, I think feudalism is an interesting word to use, and I'm not sure I would use it. Um, and I'd also say, for Afghanistan anyway, a lot of those structures are um, quite broken down. Um, so feudalism, if I understand you correctly, can be related also to patronage. Um, often, you know, there, there are some reciprocal responsibilities. Um, and the point that the diagram you saw up there is trying to make is there is very little downward distribution happening in the countries that I'm looking at. The money is being extracted and sent upwards. Whereas, even in a lot of feudal uh, uh, structures, some assets and resources move downward, be it in kind, be it protection, be it um, um, usufruct of land. So I would say I see something different, at least in India, which is that India has um, democratic institutions that still have some um, independence and sway, even though, and we have a colleague here doing fantastic work on this, uh, Milan Vaish uh, Vaishnav, um, what is it, a third of Indian politicians uh, are either criminals or under investigation or have been in jail? You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty serious, but, but there are robust democratic institutions. Um, Bangladesh, I don't know well enough to really speak to that, but I guess I would say that I'm getting stuck on your use of the word feudalism. Um, but the phenomena that we're describing may be somewhat similar in that um, uh, uh, a small, tightly networked elite is extracting most of the resources. So we have a couple right here in the front. I'm going to take two or three. We have quite a few, so please be patient. We, I've got my on the time, sir. And then we'll come here to these two. Yes, this gentleman right here on the aisle. Yes. Um, Bill Goodfellow, Center for International Policy. Thirty years ago, when we were working on El Salvador, we documented that about 10% of the U.S. aid was being stolen through a phony invoicing scheme. Maybe $20 million. There was outrage in the Hill. There were hearings. CBS Evening News did a story. And uh, reforms were made. Now, 30 years later, every time I come back from Afghanistan, I'm, st I'm just paralyzed. The corruption, hundreds of billions of dollars, it's incredible. My question is, where's the outrage? The only good sign I've seen is the response to your book. Because, you know, it's our money, much of it, American money, hundreds of billions of dollars. It's probably unprecedented in terms of volume. But I don't see the outrage on the Hill. So why don't you go ahead and answer that? It's um, I think that's a great question. And it, um, it also reminds us one is often tempted to say there's been all this progress. Um, and there has been progress in, for example, banking legislation. I mean, they, you know, they, the, the, the um, consciousness is changing to some extent on this issue, but that's a very good reminder that um, we're, we're initiating these changes in consciousness from a real deficit compared to where we may have been 30 years ago. And what it suggests to me I'm also often asked, gosh, there's always been corruption. Why are you getting upset about it now? 
and especially in the countries that I'm looking at. And I ask people in these countries, well, this isn't new, right? I mean, what, what, why are you guys upset about it now? And is there a moment when things changed? And I get a moment from everyone. They can always name the year or approximately the year. And it's the mid to late 1990s. Um, that's when things went off the rails. And I've got a hypothesis that's a pretty sweeping hypothesis, but it's that this is connected, this change in public ethics, both here at home, why are we not outraged about it, and in the behavior of a lot of these governments that I've been looking at, it's connected to some degree with the fall, the collapse of communism, and the kind of Reagan-Thatcher, um, you know, greed is good, amassing money is a sign of success, and it's a so sign that you've done well in your life. It's, there's been a real revolution in kind of the ethics of political economy since the 1980s. And I'm not trying to say that communism wasn't corrupt and that it wasn't hypocritical, but what's really interesting is there was at least a cap on the conspicuous consumption of your wealth. Now that cap may also have led to the um, underperformance of those economies because people weren't interested in doing work if they couldn't enjoy the benefits of it. But you know, once communism collapsed and when you had Reagan and Thatcher out there saying, live it up, people started really living it up and people didn't seem to mind as much when their money was stolen. And a really interesting example, well, I'll leave it there because we've got other questions. Okay. I thought you were about to start talking about our country, but uh, we'll, I could do that. We'll I could do the, that. We'll come back to the, this woman here, uh, ma'am. Hello, I'm Eleanor Bachrock. I've worked for USAID in Ukraine, which I won't talk so much about, and Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, which I will talk some about. Um, I'll also point to the irony that the US Supreme Court, I understand, is now just defining corruption as only quid pro quo, which goes very much in the wrong direction. Uh, but what upsets me is how much uh, we as aid people, military anyway, Americans were a part of the corruption problem. Exactly. And not, uh, and often inadvertently, but still, and I'd like to just mention a couple of things. I mean, the most Briefly. obvious is Briefly. that we, yeah, yeah. Okay, the most obvious is we had to work with corrupt officials, but also we spent huge amounts of money on ourselves, our comfort, exactly. our protection, dollarization of the economy, which hurts other people, um, overlooking, uh, as this gentleman said, disappearance of millions and billions of dollars. And also, I have to say this because it was praised so much, the surge in Iraq, which was really based in many, much of the success was paying off local warlords, leaders, what have you. And so is there any way we can provide the help we want without being part of the problem? Well, that's exactly what we're really talking about here is that we are exacerbating this, this problem. And on the money that we spent, now this is still in play right now, but shockingly, the commander of the ISAF in Afghanistan just classified all of the information to do with what our money is buying when we're spending it on the Afghan National Security Forces. So all of a sudden, it is classified to know how many people are learning English with the money that we're spending to teach them English, how many, you know, what equipment they're getting, and how they're doing. Now that did create some outrage, and it looks like that decision is being rolled back a little bit, but tell me how that works. Tell me how we're in a country trying to um, show a military how to behave accountably, and suddenly we classify, make it impossible for our own inspector generals to release reports uh, on how well, well we're doing. So clearly, we are part of the problem. I do believe we can interact with these countries more sensibly, and that's really what I'm calling for in this book and with the remedies that I suggest. Uh, this woman here, and then I'll come to you guys. A couple more, yeah. Hi, Lindsay Carson um, from Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. And I was actually, you know, you focus a lot 
about how corruption can fuel insecurity, but obviously anti-corruption programming, as we've seen in China and Russia, and actually before in Kenya, can be used to consolidate and sustain power, oftentimes in regimes that are themselves kleptocracies. And so I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about that tension between corruption and the need to prioritize it, but also the potential use of anti-corruption initiatives to sustain what are fundamentally systemically corrupt regimes. That's precisely why I'm a little bit nervous, our conversation earlier, about anti-corruption programming. Because if you're putting programming into uh, uh, an element of a kleptocratic network that may in fact be used as an enforcement arm because if you start pointing the anti-corruption um, commission against your political rivals or against dissidents, it becomes part of the problem. So that's why this kind of political economy analysis is critical upstream of deciding what you're going to uh, invest in. And in my view, absent real clear understanding that you've got a remarkable reformer stuck like a fly in amber in the middle, of, or it's amber in a, in, a, in a rotting fly, you know, of a corrupt system like this central bank governor or a previous head of the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission in Nigeria who really seemed to be pretty good. If you're positive of that, then your support can actually be a, um, almost like a firewall around him, protecting him from or her from being undermined by the, by the kleptocratic government. But in cases like that, I would say most programming needs to go to the population, not to the government. We'll take a couple more, just so you know. We have about 10 more minutes. We're going to finish by 525. There's going to be a reception downstairs. We're going to have books on sale and the author is here to sign. Uh, you don't want to miss and we can continue the conversation yeah, within re we'll reason. We'll take some more. This know. gentleman's been patient here, and then I'm going to come over here. Yes, sir. Uh, he, 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 I'm sorry, I stutter sometimes. Yes, George Mindy, former Army Afghan hand. I've got two, uh, two quick questions. First one, in your book, you described the September 2010 NSC principals meeting where the State Department... 2009. Correction, 2009. Uh, sorry, no, you're right. 2010. Okay. I lied. 2010. Where the State Department says that we should not try to do anything about corruption and leave it to Karzai. And looking back at its history, I mean, do we need something like a Harry Truman style NSC 68 type directive to go and say, this is a priority which needs to be addressed across the whole of government and resourced? And the second question I've got is, do we really have the, do we have at present the cultural expertise across the whole of government to recognize that difference between that qualitative difference between corrosive corruption like you're describing and the moral economy of reciprocity, which we do see in some of these countries where it is both ways and is seen as just. Do we have that cultural expertise across the whole of government? And assuming what your answer is, what are some things we can do to try to further develop that? Thank you. God, these are great questions. I should have expected that. Um, number one, yes, we need a presidential you know, directive, and that's one of the tools that I include in the book. They're chief of state tools. There are, I, I'm not sure I did legislature tools, so I needed to talk to Jane a little bit further. But, um, but yeah, I, I really think, so let, let me just broaden from that a tiny bit and say, more broadly, this, I'm arguing that this is one of the underlying drivers of extremism, right? I remember the President of the United States not too long ago saying, Unless we address the, under, the underlying root causes of extremism, a war without end is going to be counterproductive. Then he went on to talk about the military approach, right? Then he gave another speech about the military approach to extremism. We've had three presidential speeches, at least, on the military approach. Where's the presidential speech on here are some of the non-military approaches to this problem. So until the president makes it clear, both in something like a directive and in a speech to the country, that this is for real, I don't see the various bureaucracies in this town really getting behind it. So that's one. Do we have the expertise? Probably not. Um, and one of the things, by the way, in case you didn't pick it up, those of you who are going to buy the book shortly. This is not a policy wonk book. This is like get inside my skin and live through this thing. So I hope that those of you who have read it will, I mean, I, let me just put it this way. I've tried to be pretty candid about how wrong I got this 
you know, as I moved through this process. And it took me, I would say, two, three years between, before I started to twig to it. So you're in Afghan hands, that, that's a five-year commitment. We don't have that often in the United States government where, where our folks commit to a place and its culture for five years. And I'm telling you, it takes minimum two years to start getting the feeling for how these places operate. I, I, I can say that having come to sort of get it in Afghanistan, that gave me a huge leg up when I was looking at it in Tunisia or Nigeria. I knew what questions to ask. And that's the second answer to your question, is part of what gets us smarter is by having Let's say USAID decides we need to start doing political economy analysis and goes to embassies and starts asking questions. Well, that then drives collection. It drives intelligence collection and it drives information collection on the part of embassy officials. So one way you get smarter is by asking the right questions and through those questions forcing the uh, bureaucracy, frankly, to get smarter itself. Had one hand over here. I'm sorry, all the way in the back. She's been patient, then here, and then we need to. I'm not going to be able to get to everyone. Uh, finish up. Thank you. I appreciate it. Nice uh, and loud, please. Sure. My name is Jessica Manash, and I just came back from doing a Rotary Fellowship and scholarship abroad in the region. I was in the Middle East, and um, for, I was there for a year and a half, and spoke with a lot of people. And I decided to write my final paper actually about six months ago precisely on how extremist groups capitalize on state corruption to gain the support of the population. So you were devastated when her book came out. And <laughs> Partially, but yeah, actually sorry. I'm really interested. I mean, it's, it's directly related, obviously, but most of the analysis had to do with how the evidence and the facts stand on the ground, how these groups are, I mean, most of what we see here in the media, it's all the violence. But there's no, no, no one emphasizes or highlights how, for example, Hezbollah in the south of, in the south of Lebanon has been opening up their hospitals to not just the Shia population that is continuously marginalized for over 30 years, but also Christians, you know, people who don't support them. Same thing with Al-Qaeda and Hamas in, in Gaza. So we continuously focus on, because national security trumps well-being, is just is how it is. But wouldn't this be a good selling point for, you know, for making a new agenda? I'm just curious about that. Thanks. I want to just take one more, then we'll finish up. It's uh, right here. Sorry, I know it's hard to, yeah, it's also hard to hand up. Yeah, I'm uh, Tom Duvall here at Carnegie, and I, I've heard you talk about this three times. Just uh, right. It gets, <laughs> get, get, gets better and better. I, I come back for more. Um, I want you to address the linguistic, uh, this linguistic problem here, um, Sarah. I think... You know, when we talk about corruption, surely this is the wrong word for what you're describing. Corruption is maybe what you have in the District of Columbia, where there's a kind of legal norm which is being corrupted by some people with a bad agenda. And then there's also um, cultural issues, some countries where you know, nepotism is actually just helping your family and it's not corruption. But your, your corruption is not the word, really, a good word for what you're describing. You're, you're describing something which is is the norm. It's not, it's not a norm that is being corrupted. This is, this is the state norm. And is, is that part of the problem about why people are, yeah. are adopting the wrong policies? On this? Just, this woman's been very patient here. Can you want to just slip your comment or question, then we'll finish. Yeah. Okay. My name is Beverly Hong Fincher. I'm a retired academic. Um, since the chair talked about China, and I wonder what can the US government help China to fight their tigers and flies. Mm. And Take what I, you... And I, yeah. I, I think there is a, a, a from bottom up movement in yes, China. Yes, yes. You'll me. notice that China was yellow on this map. Oh, uh, that's yeah. for popular, popular demonstrations. Yes. That's why it was yellow. There Let me can choose, yeah. Yeah, I'll, I think I'll try to uh, take each of them swiftly. On Hezbollah, absolutely. Um, and there was recently an article in the New York Times about Taliban justice. And we hear about Taliban justice swift and brutal. And it's also just, you know. I mean, this was happening all over the rampant. <laughs> In 2008-9, I was sort of amused to see it as a big front page article because I was like, well, yeah, right, you know. But people were, um, the Taliban could subpoena people and they were not 
corruptible. So again, I'm not, not all of these movements are governing. I think we need to learn more about what it's like to live under ISIS in, in Iraq. Um, it might not be as bad as, all, as the only thing that we're hearing in the newspaper, but it may not be like Hezbollah in Lebanon either. But I think it's a really important point to make that these um, folks are to sometimes and to some degree actually offering an alternative. On the word, I disagree with you that it's the wrong word because Afghans do not say this nepotism is fine. That's what, I, that's what I said before. Afghans are furious about it and see it as a violation of norms. Um, and that takes me back to um, whoever mentioned the Supreme Court right here in front. Um, uh, Zephyr Teachout has written a great book about corruption in America, and boy, I'd love to riff on corruption in America if we weren't in a foreign policy think tank. Um, but the point that she makes is this narrowing of the definition of the word corruption in American jurisprudence to this very narrow quid pro quo bribery is a complete revolution in American jurisprudence. And she demonstrates that she's a professor of law, apart from being a former candidate for governor of New York. And she demonstrates it through a really good work piece of legal scholarship. And in fact, the way I see it and the way she sees it, is a much broader, um, maybe slightly more amorphous definition of the word corruption and, and, and to where the Constitution of the United States, and let's go back further, the English Civil War and the constitutionalism that was developed during that period, or even the Dutch constitutionalism another hundred years earlier, were in effect corruption prevention mechanisms. How can we structure our government so as to ward off this capture, disproportionate capture of um, public resources by a small clique for its private benefit? And so, yes, I'll, yeah, yeah, exactly, kleptocracy. And so I'll concede that this is a broad reading of the word, but I still claim the word. I'll also concede that most Americans don't understand the word the way I'm using it. Most of them, or in particularly American decision makers. So in that sense, you may be right that I'm putting people to sleep by using the word corruption. And that's why we're trying to make this such a dynamic and fun event, is like corruption can be sexy, right? On China, I think that's one of the toughest ones. How does a country like the United States influence a country like China, which doesn't really need much from us? And that's where it's really, and you say, how do we help go after the flies and the tigers? But I'm a little worried that this is all coming from Xi. And which flies and which tigers is he going after? You want to add something? Right, right. So there are things like that that can be done. There are supporting fires that can be provided. But I also think it's important for people like US officials in their conversations with, with officials from China. You, you want to be a grown-up superpower. You want to be a member of the international community. Some responsibilities go with that. And those responsibilities don't stop at the borders of China. They also have to do with how you behave in Africa. Because it's not, there isn't just corruption in China. China is exploiting the corruption of Africa. And that's no fair. And it's bad not just for the welfare of African people, but it's bad for international security. Sarah, you know, not many <clears throat> books produced by policy scholars cross over into John Stewart and, and others, uh, you have. And I don't think it's a mystery, though. It goes back to what I said at the start. This is a book primarily based on experience, a deep appreciation of history and synthesis, and caring, a sense of injustice and passion. That's what makes a book worth reading. So uh, thanks for your work. Thanks for this session. Thanks to all of you.